Chalo Dilli, onwards to Delhi. That was their battle cry. More than that, it was an expression of pain for a long sought after dream. A dream of freedom for India. Give me blood and I'll give you freedom, he had said. And from Singapore, on that overcast July day in 1943, the Azad Hind Fauj would begin its march to Delhi. They would reach Imphal, and for the first time, the Indian flag would flutter proudly in the Indian sky. Yet the moment of triumph would be fleeting. In the jungles of Burma, the forgotten army would make one last stand and their dream was to shatter in the pain of defeat. More than half a century later, some of them returned. the Azad Hind expedition would retrace that historic march. This is the story of those who returned. Today, the bustling city-state of Singapore is an economic powerhouse, one of the Asian tigers whose roar dominates the world economy. Fifty years ago, however, another roar was to go forth from Singapore, a roar that shook the very foundations of the British Empire in India. The story of the Azad Hind Fauj, or the Indian National Army, truly begins with what Winston Churchill called the worst disaster and the biggest capitulation in British history, the fall of Singapore. By February 1942, the Japanese Imperial Army's lightning advance down the Malayan Peninsula had brought it to the gates of the seemingly impregnable British fortress of Singapore. The last natural barrier was the Johor Straits, and the Japanese quickly crossed it, untouched by the island's large guns, which expected the invasion from the sea. The guns were all facing eastward, and the Japanese, on the 8th of February 1942, came in from the northwest. Across the front line, resistance amongst the 135,000 British, Australian and Indian soldiers collapsed as they faced only 30,000 Japanese soldiers. On the 15th of February, Singapore was within range of Japanese artillery. General Percival, the British commander, invited the Japanese to discuss terms of peace. Yamashita, the Japanese commander, was stunned with only a few days supplies and ammunition. He had in fact been thinking of calling off the final assault. But General Percival, unaware of the Japanese position, saw no way out and surrendered unconditionally. 90,000 men were taken prisoner by the Japanese. Half of them were Indians. The next day, to their great surprise, the Indian prisoners were separated from their British comrades. On the 17th of February, the Indians received orders to march to a nearby football field called Farrah Park. Under an overcast sky that day, 1942, among those who gathered was a young officer of the British Indian Army, Captain Gurbak Singh Dillon. It's very changed. There were skyscrapers. Those who 50 years later, 
he returns with Lieutenant Yadav to the place where they first heard about the Azad Hind Fauj. When I see this place, I'm reminded of 17th February 1942. General Percival had surrendered on the 15th evening and we were spread out all over the island from different places. We were ordered to collect here what was called old race course or uh, Ferrer Park. So we came and all this place was full of Indian soldiers. We were all without water, without food, we had assembled here. Just you imagine that we had lost the battle and we didn't know what is in store for us. And then General Fujiwara, at that time a major, he came and he said, you Indians have been surrendered to us as prisoners. And we are Asian, so are you. Your country, the land of Buddha, the land of Gandhi, they are fighting for their liberation. You soldiers should also come forward uh, to, to uh, fight. How can a brother keep a brother as a prisoner? For us, you are free people. And then he said that I hand you over to Captain Mohan Singh, the general officer commanding of the Indian National Army. That was the first time we heard that name. Earlier, Mohan Singh had become a Japanese prisoner of war in Malaya. He had taken upon himself the responsibility for forming an Indian National Army, composed of Indian prisoners of war. Captain Mohan Singh, uh, the, he said that who will volunteer for the uh, freedom of India? So everybody, most of the people, they put their hands up instead of one, both hands up. And there were uh, naras, slogans of uh, Inkilab Zindabad, Azad Hind Zindabad and that type of, you see, some people threw their pagdis up into the air or caps up and some people even stood up and jumped up. There was absolutely a change of mood from, uh, from uh, defeated people into something that we are going to achieve something. So I remained there throughout the night along with my men, struggling in the mind. And by the morning of 18th, I had decided that I will join the IN. So for me, this was the decisive place, the decisive point, somewhere over that dark place, in between words, I. Within a fortnight of the Farrah Park meeting, more than 40,000 men had joined the INA. But there were a number of problems in the practical task of organizing the Liberation Army. Many felt that the way the Japanese treated the new army and Indian prisoners of war as a whole was unsatisfactory. And a dispute led to the arrest of General Mohan Singh. Soldiers and civilians alike, what the Indians needed was a leader. Someone who could seize the movement with both hands and propel it forward. A great many Indians in East Asia knew that there was only one man outside India who could start a real Indian National Army. And that man was in Germany. Subhash Chandra Bose had escaped from house arrest in India 
and reached Berlin in April of 1941. Although Bose had no sympathy for the Nazis, he had come to Germany in order to gain access to the soldiers in the British Indian Army, captured as prisoners of war. Bose clearly identified the British Indian Army as the ultimate instrument of colonial control and was determined to subvert the loyalty of these Indian soldiers to the King Emperor and replace it with a new loyalty to the Indian nation. Bose dreamt of raising a legion of 50,000 and advancing overland along with German forces to drive the British from India. But only 4,000 soldiers joined and the legion fell far short of an army fit to invade India. Hitler had no sympathy for Indian nationalism and when they came face to face, the Führer avoided the issue of India's independence and Bose's demand to remove from Mein Kampf racist references offensive to Indians. Also, with the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Bose realized his hopes of invading India from overland were hopeless. Totally disillusioned with Germany, Subhash Chandra Bose and a young companion, Abid Hassan, began an epic journey on the 8th of February 1943, the first stage of which was in a German submarine. In enemy infested waters near Madagascar, Bose was transferred to a Japanese submarine. After 90 days under the oceans, he arrived in Sumatra. From there, he flew to Tokyo, where he spent a couple of months. And on the 2nd of July, 1943, Subhash Chandra Bose arrived in Singapore. Thousands had gathered at the Kalang airstrip to greet him on his arrival. Among them was a young doctor, Lakshmi Swaminathan. I still remember very clearly the day that Netaji arrived in Singapore. I was one among the thousands of Indians, men and women, awaiting his arrival. Seeing him, I knew that all the months we had passed of the INA crisis of frustration and uh, despair were now over, that at last we had found a leader who had come to lead us on to Delhi, on to victory. And the very next day, there was a meeting at the Cathay Hall which every single Indian man, woman and child attended and I was also one amongst those. Fifty years later, the scene of that meeting in the Cathay Cinema is still fresh in the memory of these veterans. A popular cinema theatre today, it was at that time the tallest building in Singapore. Seated in the first row at that meeting, Colonel Dillon caught his first glimpse of Netaji. It was to make an impression that would never leave him. I have come here after half a century and looking at Cathay, I feel blessed. This is the place where I saw the great leader, Netaji Subhash and the Bose for the first time. It was 4th of July, 1943. So blessed is this place and blessed are we because this is the spot where Netaji gave us 
first appearance, first audience, this Cathay Hall was packed like sardines by representatives of all the Indians from so many countries. I was sitting in the front row near the dais and could see Netaji clearly. Rash Bihari Bose, the president of Indian Independence League, got up and said, I have brought for you the best specimen of an Indian, Subhash Chandra Bose. Then Netaji spoke. I shall never forget his words. We will encounter hunger, thirst and death on the way. It cannot be said how many of us will return alive. The point is that in the end we shall achieve our goal. India shall be free. Even on that very first day we could all feel that now we had found a leader whom we could follow till the end. A leader who would never let us down. A leader who was very courageous and would not expect any one of us to do anything that he himself was not prepared to do. In the months that followed, Netaji addressed a series of public meetings that were to transform the lives of thousands of Indians in Singapore and in fact all over Southeast Asia. On the 6th of July, on this Maidan, in front of the Singapore City Hall, 16,000 Indian soldiers of the INA marched past Netaji as he took the salute from an improvised wooden platform hastily erected across the steps of the City Hall. It was here, at the Padang, that Netaji gave the movement its war cry. Chalo Delhi! Onwards to Delhi! Here that he called upon the thousands gathered before him to sacrifice their all for the sake of freedom. I am confident that with the help of my countrymen in East Asia, I shall be able to organize such a gigantic force as will be able to sweep away the British power from India in conjunction with those who have already been fighting at home. The hour has struck and every patriotic Indian must advance towards the field of battle. Only when the blood of freedom-loving Indians begins to flow will India attain her freedom. Inkalab Zindabad, Azad Hind Zindabad. More such mass meetings were to follow. At a second rally at the Padang on the 9th of July, Netaji addressed civilians of Indian origin. Here he called for a mobilization of all Indians in East Asia. The Azad Hind Fauj, composed only of ex-British Indian Army prisoners of war, would not do. He must have a truly national army. Netaji foresaw the creation of a regiment composed entirely of fearless, death-defying women. It would be called, in homage to the warrior queen who had fought the British in 1857, the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. The magic of Netaji's words resounded in the ears of the young Lakshmi Swaminathan, transforming her. She knew her life would never be the same again. All night, I kept awake thinking of the bombshell that Netaji had dropped when he said that he was going to start a women's regiment called the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. So early next morning, I went to see him and uh, told him that I was ready to join the regiment. So he tell, told me, I want you to first understand that it is not just a propaganda stunt, but I want you to be trained as a proper infantry soldier and then to go to the front and take up arms and fight against the British. So I said, when shall I start? He said, uh, you can start from tomorrow. So then I went round and collected 
20 young women who had also heard Netaji's speech and we practiced for three days and then presented arms to Netaji at a women's meeting. We were dressed in simple white sarees because we didn't have any uniforms but still we were able to present arms very smartly and this pleased Netaji endlessly. The barracks on Waterloo Street that housed the Rani of Chansi Regiment have now been destroyed. But as Lakshmi Swaminathan returns today to Waterloo Street, in her mind's eye, she can see herself and her colleagues going through the rigors of drill and exercises, almost as if the intervening 50 years had never happened. Mr. Jacob, you remember the higher Rani of Jhansi Regiment camp was here. And uh, we had our main barracks here. And because it's safety extended right up to that road. You're not in that huh. And uh, so that, that was our training ground. Especially seeing this place, I can yeah. see all my radis as we were called, you know, lined up here. We used to start at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, and th there we used to have our yes. PT flag yeah. hoisting ceremony. Yeah. Unforgettable yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. People say, what about all the hardships? But you know, when you have a goal, when you have a sincere and wonderful leader, then all these things don't matter at all, you know. October came, and on the 21st of the month, Bose announced the formation of the Arzi Hukumat e Azad Hind, the Provisional Government of India, and Lakshmi took her place as a minister for the official photograph. At a solemn ceremony at the cafe cinema, Netaji took the oath of allegiance. In the name of God, I take this sacred oath to liberate India and 400 million of my countrymen. Tears welled in his eyes and his throat choked with emotion as he continued, I, Subhash Chandra Bose, will continue the sacred war of freedom till the last breath of my life. Three days later, 50,000 Indians assembled at the Padang. An afternoon sun shone gently on them, as Bose proclaimed. The provisional government of Azad Hind declared war on Britain and America at five minutes past midnight. The British know very well that I say what I mean, and that I mean what I say. So when I say war, I mean war. War to the finish. War that can only end in the freedom of India. Their war of independence had begun. Singapore, renamed Sionan by the Japanese, was established as the supreme headquarters of the INA. I am confident that with the help of my countrymen in East Asia... Netaji's appeal for total to mobilization resounded through the Malayan Peninsula and evoked a tremendous response. From, India, in Kalab, in from Penang to Johor Bahru, Indians came forth by the thousands to volunteer. Malaya became the INA's principal recruiting ground for civilian volunteers, as thousands upon thousands began enlisting. It was from the grounds here, at the Royal Selangor Club in Kuala Lumpur, that Netaji gave his call to his fellow countrymen in Malaya. On the evening of the 5th of September, 1943, a 16-year-old girl, Janaki Thema, arrived at the ground two hours early to get a good glimpse of the man she had read so much about in the newspaper. In August 1943, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose arrived at this Flango Club Padang. So I was preparing myself to come here by 6 o'clock, but then you know, I had to leave the house at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I took my bicycle 
and paddled along. And from there I came right here along this road here, left my bicycle on the drain there. There was a drain there. I just pushed my bicycle into the drain. By then there was crowds of people, thousands and thousands of people in this field, in this Maidan. And there I'm waiting for them for Netaji Subhash when the boats to arrive. At about five o'clock, Netaji Subhash in the boats and his team of people arrived. As soon as he arrived, I was so happy to see him. I just didn't know what I was doing. I just chucked my bicycle, left my bicycle and I was waiting for the moment. And then Subhash and the boats was with the Colonel Lakshmi and few others people on this this place here, there was a big stage there, they were sitting down there. Then Netaji spoke about the Indians and what the Indians should do for their country for the, at that time, you see, for the motherland. That he wanted all the Indians, whoever were here to join the movement that is the INA, Indian National Army, and devote all their, whatever they can for the country. Then they asked, he also asked them for whatever the things they could give, you see, he asked for money, cash or in kind. So I was just moved by that. By then, you see, we started shouting, Inkulab Jindaba, Inkulab Jindaba, Netaji Jindaba, Netaji Jindaba. And then the whole crowds, after I had said Netaji, everybody joined me and started shouting, Subhash Chandra Boske J, Subhash Chandra Boske J, Netaji J, Netaji Jindaba. Then at once, after he had said that, he wanted people to give contribution. So I just, kept out my bicycle and just took out my chain, took out my earrings and walked across the field and just handed over my earrings and my chain and my earrings to Subhash Chandra Bose and gave it to him. Her life was to change that evening. As she cycled home after the meeting, she resolved to enlist in the INA and fight for her motherland, a motherland she had never seen. Then I went back home in the bicycle. By then it was already dark, six or seven o'clock, I think. There was no light in the bicycle. And the policeman stopped me and said, why are you driving in the dark? He stopped me, I said, I cried. I cried to him, then he let me go. So I went home. As soon as I went home, I left my bicycle at the fence of the house, and then I went back and, and washed my hair, thinking my parents won't, my mother won't be able to detect that my earrings was missing. So I went back and slept. Janaki believed that Captain Lakshmi was the only one who could help her. Through a friend of her father's, she prevailed upon Captain Lakshmi to come to her house and help convince her father. The next evening, about four or five o'clock, Colonel Lakshmi and a few others came to my house. And then I had prepared a big tea for them. Then I had already taken my form, you see. There was only a, there was an age limit, you see, for young girls. So if I, I planned myself, if I, if I, this was a time, if I don't give my father to sign this form, he may not, he may change my mind, and his mind and would not allow me to join the regiment. So at once with the Dr. Lakshmi there, who was very cooperative with me and told my father, it's nice for your daughters to join, your daughter is wonderful, she can join the regiment, and he must be very happy that she is joining the regiment for the cause of the country. Then my father said, okay, she can join. So what I did at once, I got the form, filled it, and gave it to my father. My father said, keep it, I'll sign it. Said, no, father, please sign it now. He said, we'll keep it later, keep it, but I still insisted on him signing. Then I managed to get him to sign, sign permission for me to join the regiment. As they strolled today over the manicured turf of the Selangor Club's cricket ground, they're overcome by a flood of memories. Little did they imagine then that this 16-year-old who had lied about her age so that she could enlist would go on to become second in command of the Rani Jhansi Regiment. Within five months of Netaji's arrival in Singapore, the revitalized INA had begun to move up towards Burma. And by December 1943, the INA's first division had reached Rangoon. The delta of the mighty Irrawaddy River is like a hydra-headed monster. 
The river flows into the Bay of Bengal through several mouths, on one of which lies the port town of Rangoon, Burma's most important commercial center for over 300 years, and its capital since Burma fell to the British in 1885. The very name, Rangoon, is an anglicized corruption of the Burmese Yangon, which means end of dangers. The supreme command of the INA was transferred from Singapore to Rangoon in January 1944. This move in itself was momentous, for only a single border now separated the INA from India. Access to the eastern gates of Fortress India was within reach. Burma was to become the launching pad to mount the final offensive which would free India. The march of the Army of Liberation seemed unstoppable. Rangoon became, in a manner of speaking, an extension of the Indian struggle for independence, its farthest defining point. Today, this city is a mosaic of ancient, colonial, and contemporary Burma. But nothing in Rangoon is as imposing as the glistening gold stupa of the Shwedagon Pagoda which continues to dominate Rangoon, as perhaps no other single structure does in any other major city of the world. The Burmese believe that the soul of Rangoon resides in this massive bell-shaped pagoda that soars a clear hundred meters into the azure sky. Fittingly, when the INA's veterans retrace the route they took half a century ago, they first pay homage to the soul of the city that harbored their supreme headquarters during the war. As she walks around the Shwedagon today, Janaki Thevar recalls the days she and her comrades in the Rani Jhansi regiment spent here five decades ago, virtually in the shadow of this temple. She does not look upon her return today as a pilgrimage, but as the fulfillment of a promise, a promise she had made to herself half a century earlier. refreshing ourselves after training when we used to come back you know we used to come to this Buddhist temple every evening all the girls used to come here because we had nothing to do but just to come to the temple and pray for our success of achieving our goal to India and then we made a wish we used to come and hit the gong just before we were about to leave Netaji came to the camp and he said I'm afraid girls you all have to go back home things are not so good so you have to go back so with a very heavy heart we said we'll come back but my girls did want to come they said, they said we don't want to go because we want to go and fight for India. One of them, then I came myself alone. I hit the gong and I said to myself, I will come back one day and I hit them. Now after 50 years I'm coming back to this country which I feel very happy and proud. For a full 50 years, Janaki nursed that faith, that conviction. 
Now she feels vindicated. Swedagon, she believes, called her back. Janke is not alone. The Burmese people share her faith too. It draws them to the temple long after the sun has set, and nothing lights the night sky but the gilded glow of the Shwedagon pagoda. <laughs> At first, everything seems as it always was, fixed and unchanging. But as the INA veterans move around the town, trying to locate the places and people of yesteryear, they begin to realize that Burma's apparent immutability is deceptive. Fifty years is a long time, and time does not stand still, not even in Burma. The Kambe Recruitment Center, once teeming with activity, is now an abandoned scrapyard. The Kambe Railway Station, from where thousands of INA soldiers embarked for the front, stands revealed today as just another suburban station. Slums have overrun the Golshala training grounds. The days spent here training for the march on Delhi can be retraced only in the mind's eye through the prism of memory. <laughs> As they rediscover the city, the veterans discover a memorial to a man who is referred to as the father of the nation, General Aung San. A friend and admirer of Netaji's, Aung San sought to adopt the same strategy, seeing in Britain's travails his country's opportunity, in Britain's enemy his country's ally. Commanding the Burmese National Army, he had helped the Japanese to defeat the British and then declared Burma independent. But he soon discovered that independence in a Japanese dispensation was a mirage. When the Allies began their attempt to regain Burma in 1945, Aung San and the Burmese National Army defected to the Allied side. Aung San was assassinated at the age of 37, just weeks before his final objective was achieved. Netaji and uh, General Aung San had established a very good relationship in Burma and uh, he had sent word secretly when the Burmese army defeat, decided to uh, break their relationship with the Japanese and to contact the British. So Netaji said, after all, the Burmese army is operating on their own side and they are independent to take whatever action they want to. But we are only using Burma as a stepping stone into going into India. So we must carry on our fight. And also, we would not like to desert the Japanese at this stage of the war. Only one request he made was that the Burmese army should not attack the INA, because there was no question of the INA attacking them, because our objective was India and nothing in Burma. And I must say that General Aung San, he kept his word and all during the remaining of the campaign, the Burmese army never attacked the INA. As she pays homage to Aung San, father of the Burmese nation, Captain Lakshmi ruminates on the irony that today Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of the man who gave his life 50 years ago, so that his country may obtain freedom from foreign rule, should be engaged in a struggle to preserve that very freedom.
But her adversaries are not foreigners. Aung San Suu Kyi has never forgotten that she is the daughter of Burma's national hero. There is a certain inevitability about the way she assumes her father's mantle, accepting her duty to serve as a symbol, an icon, the crystallization of a nation's hope, its longing, its need to breathe free. What the veterans are so eagerly looking for is the house that served as the INA's supreme headquarters and where Netaji also stayed for some time. Will it still be there? Is the question they ask themselves. This is Jama House, Netaji used office in olden days. Omo was a child during the war, living on what was called Jamal Avenue. He recalls seeing many Indian soldiers in Rangoon and leads the veterans to a house where he remembers seeing Netaji. The veterans recognize the house. But this was just a house for the staff, not the supreme headquarters. Meher Onissa, now 69, has been living opposite this house for 65 years. Her father, Ibrahim Khan, was a close associate of General Shah Nawaz Khan. Memories of her first meeting with Netaji are still fresh in her mind. Mr. Salim and Shah Nawaz Sahib were living here. Subhad Chandra Bose Sahib was always coming and living for a few days. And suddenly, one day, his health was bad. He was in the pages. So my father said, कि देखो नेताजी साहब का तबीयत खराब हुआ बेटी तो कुछ बना के भेजना है तो जी मैंने तो क्या कहा मूंग का दाल का खिचड़ी और पुदीना की चटनी और मैंने पीस के भेजे उन्होंने दो तीन दिन खाए खा के बहुत खुश हुआ और उनकी तबीयत भी अच्छा हुआ फिर उन्होंने एक चिट्ठी लिख के दिया है मुझे कि कटार कच्चा कटहार की तरकारी का तो उन्होंने लिख के दिया तो मैं उसी तरह वो लिखा वही तरह उससे भर के भी मैं मसाला डाल के उनको पका के भेजा तो बहुत खुशी हुआ। फिर मैंने एक दिन कटार का कुछ भजिया बना के भेजा तो वो भी खा के बहुत खुशी हुआ। तो फिर उन्होंने मेरे अब्बा को कहा कि लड़की को मेरे पास बुला के आ तो मुझे ले के गया तो मुझे कहा कि तुम क्या मंगता मांगो ये मैंने कहा मैं कुछ नहीं मंगता आप अच्छा हो गया � चला गया सानिवास साहब और नेताजी साहब वे जाके कहा था कि हम जाके आप लोग को वापस कुछ भेजेगा खत तो मैं खत का इंतजार अब तक करते थे तो कोई खत नहीं है ना सानिवास साहब का आया ना नेताजी साहब का आया तो कुछ हम लोगों को तो कुछ खबर ही नहीं मिला यहाँ पर मेजर सलीम सानिवास और बहुत सा सब लोग यहाँ रहते थे Mayor Unisa leads the veterans to what was once the supreme headquarters of the Azad Hind Fauj. Shanivas Sahib was there, Mr. Salim was there, and many of the people were there. You were down in the bottom of the camera. To Captain Yadav, this is like a homecoming. Stationed here during the INA stay in Burma, he had many an occasion to observe Netaji from close quarters. Walking in this familiar courtyard, he can feel all over again the courage, resolution, and high degree of motivation the INA had reached by the beginning of 1944. The moment of truth had arrived. And on the 3rd of February, 1944, the first guerrilla regiment under General Shahnawaz began its move to the frontiers of India. 
the march to Delhi had begun. By early January of 1944, the INA had established its supreme headquarters in Rangoon. And by the end of the month, a full-scale attack was launched on two fronts, the Arakan and Imphal. While INA troops sped towards Imphal, Netaji established his advance headquarters at Memu, a small town in the hills east of Mandalay. With their advance headquarters now at Memu, the city of Mandalay became a transit center for the INA's troops. Mandalay, not Rangoon, is where Burma's past and present truly converge. It is the historic city from where Burmese kings rule the whole country. And even now, it reflects the cultural heartbeat of the Burmese people. Netaji's first contact with Mandalay was during the three years he spent in jail there between 1924 and 1927 as a prisoner of the British. Years later, he would write, till then, Mandalay was but a name to us. I had a hazy idea that it was the capital of the last independent kingdom of Burma. But I remember distinctly that it was the place where Lokmanya Tilak had been imprisoned for nearly six years, and later on, Lala Lajpat Rai for about a year. It gave us therefore some consolation and pride to feel that we were following in their footsteps. As we drove to the prison inside the fort, outlined against the morning sky, we saw beautiful structures, which we were told were the palace and state buildings of the old kingdom. The memory of the good old days that were no more produced a pang in our hearts, and we began to wonder when Burma would once more be able to fly her flag of independence. Nature's beauty and the tragic relics of Burma's history intertwine here in Mandalay. On the 20th of March, 1945, this fort was bombed so heavily by the British that the interior of the fabled Golden City was reduced to rubble and ashes. What remained was a broken shell, some walls and a moat. Today, a replica of the once magnificent palace is all there is to remind one of Burma's past glories. Captain Lakshmi returns to this palace half a century after she first discovered it. And as she walks through the palace, she relives her days here with the women of the Rani Jhansi regiment who were on their way to Maimyo. As the sound of her footsteps resound in these empty spaces, she can, even now, hear the laughter of her comrades and see the shine in their eyes, so certain were they of victory then. But through the laughter, she can also hear the cries and groans of the wounded as they were brought here from the Imphal front. In Mandalay, we were more or less confined to this fort area because going out was dangerous. The place was bristling with spies and they, must, they had been sending messages because uh, every time Netaji came, there was a very heavy bombardment. Netaji's headquarters had been moved to Maimyo because that was a very safe place and uh, Mandalay was so exposed. 
but he also expected only to stay in uh, Vemeo for a few weeks and then move on further to, towards the front. For months, this beautiful town on the edge of the Shan Plateau was to be the hub of the INA. Within a week of Bose's arrival in Maimyo, Captain Lakshmi brought up a contingent of the Rani Jhansi Regiment. During the Imphal campaign, Maimyo was very important to us because it was here that Netaji established his advance headquarters. And uh, various uh, units of the INA were also based here. The Azad Hind Dal was also the advance party because they were to be the civilian forces when once we occupied various parts of India. They were also here and I brought up one unit of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment also to Maimyo and uh, we started training here and preparing ourselves for advance. Maimyo had traditionally a strong Indian population and uh, due, to, due to the war most of the Burmese had fled the town and gone to various villages because they were afraid of being taken away by the Japanese to do uh, labor and later they were a fear of air raids. But the Indians stayed on here and they were most helpful to us in every way. Returning to Maimyo 50 years later, Captain Lakshmi didn't expect to find any of her colleagues. But a visit to a familiar house revealed Dr. Montu Banerjee. <laughs> हम लोग बहुत उम्र बहुत दिनों के बाद इधर बोलिए ना साढ़े तीन हजार फुट ऊपर चोटियों पर मुलाकात हो रहा है और आप और आपको हम ले चलेंगे जो जो आपका प्यारा जगह था यानी आपको दिन बचपन का दिन याद आ जाएगा आप लोग किस तरह आईएनए में कटा मंटू बैनर्जी वाज़ द मेन सप्लायर ऑफ मेडिसिंस टू द आईएनए � his sister Parul was in the Rani Jhansi regiment commanded by Captain Lakshmi. Today he guides her to the place where the regimental camp had been built all those years ago. I am very happy we have found this place because this building is exactly as it was when we had the Rani of Jhansi Regiment camp here. But only this overgrown place that you see here was all nicely leveled as a field and we used to have our flag post here in the middle. Dr. Banerjee, now 84, leads a solitary existence here in Maimyo. And all he lives on are his memories. I possess nothing now. But still, old people, when we meet each other, we remember those old days. You remember when I brought the one platoon of Rani of Jhansi Regiment girls and we came to your village. We went back very late. We got, got back to our camp huh. after midnight. Yeah, after midnight. Yeah. So, uh, Major Rasmi came to our camp, you know. It was late at night. That time, that road was full with tigers and bears and then bears and even leopards. So we told them, don't take the risk. They said, no, we are after all soldiers. We got to go to the Kohima front. We'll, we'll advance with these few girls that are with me, we'll go to the front. I'm not afraid, not there. And they said, yes, we are not afraid, we'll go. And they started singing that national anthem, Subha Sukha Chayane Ki Barkha Barchi, Bharata Bhag Hai Jaga. They started singing then and going, and hum dilli dilli jayenge, hum bigri hin banayenge. Now you play that on your yes, mouth organ. Yes. I remember you playing the mouth organ yes, those days. Yes. At every function you had to play. Yes. Achcha bhai, me us national anthem, me aapko, yani kaumi tarana sur par, to neta ji bhot pasand karta tha, humko hamesa bola karte the, ye gana aap hamesa bajaya karo. Usi liye me aapko hoi tarana, फिर माउथ तो लेकिन बाजा जो है वो जापानी और जर्मन बाजा ले ये चीना बाजा बजाने जाओ तो चीना सूर निकलता फिर भी मैं आपको चीना सूर में ही बाजा सुना दूँगा काउंटी तराना Thank you. 
सुभाष का कहना है तो हम दिल्ली जल कर रहना है भूल गया दहली दहली जाएंगे हम अपने हिंद बनाएंगे हम दहली दहली जाएंगे हम अपने हिंद बनाएंगे अब फौज बन के रहना है दुख तक मुसीबत है The words may be a bit rusty and parts of the refrain forgotten but his spirit is undiminished as strong as before for captain lakshmi coming to maimyo has been a journey of remembrance netaji's house stands exactly as it did during those war days this house was privy to every fluctuation in the ina's fortunes it was here that objectives were discussed strategies devised orders given and orders taken here netaji and the ina leadership swung between euphoria and despair as news of military victories and reverses trickled in captain lakshmi was a frequent visitor to this house often participating in discussions or receiving dignitaries Today only the walls remain but they aren't silent in her mind's eye everything begins to come alive our ina troops were advancing towards imphal and netaji was preparing to follow them as soon as news of the fall of imphal to our forces was heard and that we were now on the road to delhi dam badhaye ja khushi ke geet gaaye ja ye zindagi hai aum ki dukhon mein pe lutaye ja the Japanese and the INA had begun their offensive on the Imphal front in March of 1944. And on the 18th of that month, the INA had crossed the border. At last, they stood on Indian soil. In less than a month after that Kohima had been surrounded and on the 14th of April 1944 Sardare Jang Colonel Shaukat Ali Malik hoisted the Indian flag at Moirang in Manipur. For the first time the Indian flag could flutter proudly on its own territory.
Battle of Imphal continued into May and saw some of the fiercest fighting of the entire war. The INA attempted to reinforce its position and tighten the noose around Imphal. But time was running out for the INA. The Burmese monsoon, with its awesome destructive force, was fast approaching. When Netaji came up here from Rangoon, he was full of hope because the INA was advancing towards Imphal and it seemed as if they would be in Imphal soon. But unfortunately, the news that finally came was not favorable to us. The monsoon had set in early, the roads had all become slushy and our whole army was bogged down. Added to the, that, we had no air, air cover at all. The British put their superiority in the air to great advantage. More than 300 flights a day were made and supplies were dropped to those under siege in Imphal. Surrounded on all sides and cut off from the rest of India, the Allied troops were nevertheless able to hold out. On the 1st of June, the monsoon broke over Burma in fierce torrents. Soon, the INA's lines of supply were no more than rivers of mud. It was plain that the thrust through Imphal couldn't be continued. The siege was lifted on the 27th of June, 1944. The Allies began their counter-offensive aggressively emphasizing their superiority in numbers, weapons, and supplies. The INA was now on the defensive. They were forced to retreat across the Chindwin River and into the mountains. Supplies had run out, and there was no transport. The INA lost 400 in battle and another 1,500 to disease and starvation. No more than 2,600 survived the siege, and of these, 2,000 were in urgent need of medical care. The Allied advance seemed unstoppable. The last time I came here was when Netaji invited me to dinner. And I found that General Shanavas had just come up from the front. General Shanavas gave Netaji a detailed picture of the front and the condition of our troops. And it was suggested that the Mount Popa Bagan area should be held across the Irrawaddy to prevent the British moving forward as rapidly as they were towards Yangon. So rapid was the Allied advance into Burma that Maimyo had to be abandoned. Captain Lakshmi, with a few others, retreated to the remote Inlay Lake in the Shan Hills. The lake seemed a safe haven. A shadow of hostilities had not yet fallen on its placid surface. It would only be a matter of lying low until transport to Rangoon could be arranged. Shan chief gave Captain Segal and her soldiers shelter in one of these homes built on stilts. But the British were not to be thwarted. They had been on her tracks from October of 1943, when she became a minister in Netaji's government. And here, they finally pinned her down. Inlay Lake, which is surrounded by the Shan Hills, seemed to be as peaceful as it is today. 
but unfortunately we were spotted here too by British reconnaissance planes. The enemy seems to have followed us in the air because one soon after we came, one morning I was going to the market and as I was crossing a field, a lone enemy fighter came and swooped down so low that though I lay down on the ground, I could feel the, the uh, heat of the propeller and my shirt was also lifted up and they machine gunned a few peasants who were working in the fields. Captain Lakshmi fled from the comfort of the Inlay Lake up into the dense recesses of the Shan Hills. But she was to have no respite, for the enemy tracked her down there as well. But there we were captured by Karen guerrillas operating under the Force 136 of the British Army. We marched through the forest for about three days and three nights, nearly 100 miles, until we finally reached Tongu. And it was there that I was handed over to the British military authorities as a prisoner and uh, taken to Yangon. On the 1st of July, 1945, Captain Lakshmi became a prisoner of the British. The march of the Rani Jhansi Regiment was halted forever. <laughs> 